Hello everybody and welcome back. It is good to have you back. Last week we uh, spent some time on the lectures in the book talking about a network diagram and how to make that work, right? What was the optimal path through a network? And sometimes we learn that depending on how many resources we apply to that network path, it can change uh, the uh, path itself. So uh, last week was a good discussion on the network path. This week we're going to talk about the resources that you might apply uh, in that network path. And we're just going to look at a working schedule to do that, right? Schedule requiring uh, the network path requiring a number of people. Uh, as you recall overall in this course, these were slides from the first week, that th this quantitative analysis and decision making is a way to reason through complicated decision making. But the level of decision making we're doing in this course can be done by linear programming and or it can often be followed up or confirmed by doing it manually. Uh, be, but, but in the real world, some of these problems get so complex and the, the impact is big or the problem is new. Uh, it can also be done if the problem is repetitive. So it can be done, used in so many ways. And just, just know that there are many approaches. This is what I love about math. There are lots of approaches to the right answer or the same answer. A lot of approaches. Uh, we just have to uh, find it, the correct one. Yeah, in week one, we went over this problem-solving process, right, where we start with the starting with the situation itself. Then we form a problem statement. Uh, we are going to look at the model that we're going to use uh, and try and develop our solution. These are slides from week one. So if you have further comments or questions, you can go back there. And, and the situation may involve uh, the current operations. Uh, it may become a, apparent through customer complaints. Or it could just be your own conscious effort to improve efficiency or resolve an issue, right? Which is uh, what we're going to do today with uh, the staffing uh, problem that we're going to talk about uh, in a... Uh, uh, the scheduling model approach that we are going to be doing. Um, and this also ties in uh, to a real world problem that I want to show you next, right? And, and we consider then this transition from a manual procedure to automated procedures. And, but think about it. This problem was probably first uh, done on paper or done manually in a simple format to build this complex model that we're doing. It might have been done on a wink wall, which I mentioned in the discussion group during week uh, two. So it's an airline scheduling issue with American Airlines. And so... Um, what, what we do is we call a fixed airline schedule right here. We call a fixed airline schedule uh, is, is defined as each flight in the schedule is a series of legs, right? So if a flight leg, then we further define, comprises a specific takeoff uh, from an airport to a landing at another airport. So for example, Hong Kong to Bangkok, to uh, Phuket, uh, Japan, it's going to have two legs, right? Because there's there are two takeoffs and landings, Hong Kong to uh, Bangkok, and then Bangkok to Phuket. So, um, and and a key point is that these legs, flight legs, may be flown by different crews. Okay, interesting. So they're at the wink wall. They're starting to plot it out, right? Then they have to consider as a constraint crew scheduling, right? Uh, 
they have to also consider uh, aircraft types, right? Because not every crew can fly every airplane. That's one of the reasons that Southwest went to a simpler model and they only fly 737s so that they can transition crews in and out a little easier. It also solves maintenance problems and things like that, technicians, uh, qualifications, okay? Um, and so for a given aircraft type and a given time period, right, the schedule is going to repeat over a one week period. So we have to ensure that all the flight legs for a particular aircraft can have the crew assigned, right? And, and by the crew, we mean that not only the pilots, but also the cabin and service. So the crew just got complicated, right? It's not just the people in the front, it's the people serving the passengers and caring for them. So uh, there are any number of restrictions as they plotted out this problem. Um, it, for example, how many crews, uh, hours the crew can work a, a, a day. It is uh, typical when I was in the Air Force that a, a typical crew day was 12 hours and you could extend it to 14 with a waiver, but you didn't want to plan on that, right? And so uh, the potential crew schedule is a series of flight legs that is going to now satisfy these conditions. And you can read the rest of this, but the point is for the American Airlines problem, the company had a database with 12 million potential crew schedules, right? And the objective was to select a combination of schedules that is going to minimize cost. And so the constraints were to ensure that all the flight legs have a crew assigned to them, uh, that, and that the restrictions like the number of hours they can work in a day or a week aren't violated, right? Um, and so linear pro programming helped solve uh, this problem, right? Imagine with 12 million variables and 750 constraints, that could not be done manually, but it was probably built manually in its initial design on a wink wall or on paper. In the end, there were tens of millions of dollars that were saved by American doing this process. Okay, that's a little bit of background on that. Now we'll just take a few minutes and I will walk through the book's material because this is very interesting. And there's one very important point in this week's lesson, otherwise it's largely the same. And that's that we want to be careful how we define the variable, okay, or variables. So this is just a, another example of a resource allocation problem that you can then apply to your schedule, uh, network schedule that we talked about last week. So um, this sort of problem is about determining the minimum cost to satisfy various requirements. So uh, a common example is the work schedule and the labor needs in order to meet it. So you'll see on page 26, they lay out this uh, graph, right? And we define uh, X1 as a certain period of time, right? Like 12 a.m. to 4 a.m. X2 would be 4 a.m. to 8 a.m., right? And you can see the number of employees needed to meet that schedule. So the question becomes, what is the minimum number of workers needed to safely run a plant that has this many, this schedule and this many employees needed? So before we discuss the correct model, um, the book talks about looking at an incorrect model, right? Um, and so, and, and the, the focus there is on the variable. So what they do is they say, if we let our decision variable uh, be X1 through X6 or X, uh, XJ, right? They, regardless of how you define it. Um, that's the number of employees working during the J four hour period during whatever four hour period, right? Being one through six, right? And so an employee could start at 12 a.m. and go to 4 a.m. shift. Then it would, it would appear reasonable, the book says, that the number of employees needed would meet, would be the minimum, would be the solution of this following uh, linear program, right? That this, this would be uh, where we're going to, right? 
So um, this is actually incorrect. The book will point out uh, rightly um, because if you if you the sum of of x one through x six in this uh, problem counts each person two times, not just once, right? And um, this isn't really a big deal, um, but it, it counts them twice since. Each employee can actually work two shifts or eight hours. And notice the time shifts were in four hour increments, right? So uh, each person can actually work um, two of those shifts. Anyhow, we can divide the final answer by two and get the right answer. Remember I said in math, there are lots of reasons to get to the right solution, lots of ways. That's what I love about it, right? But that's not the best approach, right? Because here we have constraints that cause a bigger concern. Every variable is interrelated, x1 through x6, right? And so uh, the, in that some people who work the first four hour period also work a second four hour period. So our constraints in this current problem don't really reflect this, right? And so uh, there are interrelationships here that are nonlinear. And so what we're going to do is take a look at the variables, right? So to model this in a linear program, we want to realize that our decision variables are not how many people work during a given four hour period, but we define our variable as how many start at the beginning of each four hour period. That modifies the variable and now makes it uh, something we can use. So for example, we are now going to define, as they talk at the bottom of page 26, xi, whatever i is, 1 through 6, as the number of employees beginning their shift, right? Which is different, um, which is different than how we defined uh, the variable in the past which was the number of employees working during that period. Now it's the number of employees beginning their shift. So for example, X4 is going to indicate how many people begin their shift at 12 p.m. And we just have to make sure that 14 people are available, right? And so while this is the same formula as the incorrect model that we use, right? the variables are going to end up having different values, right? So uh, so that's about the variables. And that's really where, uh, in a working schedule model, the problems usually arise in how we define the variables. So uh, now we'll look at the constraints uh, quickly. So for example, we need at least eight employees to work between eight, uh, 12 and four, right? So who works during this time? Obviously, those who start at 12 a.m. and then at work, and then a further analysis shows that those who start at 8 p.m., they're also working between 12 and 4. And so what we want to do is ensure we have at least eight employees. So the constraint now becomes x1 plus x6 is greater than or equal to 8, because we defined x1 as 12 a.m. to 4 a.m., and uh, x6 as 8 p.m. to 12 a.m. Well, those are two four-hour shifts. So somebody could have been working 8 p.m. to 4 a 12 a.m. and then roll over to 12 a.m. to 4 a.m., covering their eight-hour shift. And so we can go on uh, like that. And we end up with uh, creating these similar constraints, and we end up with this sort of linear program problem to minimize right? These uh, different shifts, x1 through x6, uh, so that we can uh, minimize the number of workers needed uh, so that we can uh, create the right or optimal solution. Notice the constraints. There always has to be somebody working and that I must be in one of those shifts. And then the book talks about the solution that resulted from that. That's going to conclude our work today. I, l I look forward to seeing you in uh, the homework uh, area. Okay, thanks.